welcome to our most recent um, webinar. Uh, slightly different uh, today. You'll be pleased to hear that we're um, we're not all lawyers. Um, delighted to be joined uh, today by um, Nina Metzen, who is a workplace uh, communications expert at um, uh, at uh, Waddington uh, Waddington Brown. And what we want to be uh, talking to you um, about today is. Um, awful phrase, the new normal, um, what it's going to be like as we, um, I suppose, return to return to more activity, although I know many of us have been have been busy throughout the uh, throughout the lockdown. But 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 there is a general acceptance, I think, that remote working is going to be uh, where it's at. And um, uh, and that is something which I think increasingly we are starting to um, uh, to uh, see something which is going to lead to changes in, 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 in practice. Um, so Nina and I are going to um, give uh, some thoughts on that today. I think it's, it's fair to say it's a presentation of two halves, isn't it, Nina? I think, first of all, the first half is, if, is if not doom and gloom, then certainly looking at where the problems, uh, where the problems are. And it won't, won't surprise any of you to know that that's where I am speaking most as a lawyer. <laughs> Where can um, it all go wrong? Nina is also going to look at some of the uh, communications problems that this throws up. And then um, I'm going to pass over to Nina uh, really completely to look at the, the sunny uplands um, of, um, uh, of, of, of future communications um, in, a, in a remote environment and some, some sort of tricks, hints, tips, ways of doing these things. So that's what we're, we're going to do. Um, there is a questions, um, uh, a questions button, so do feel free to put your questions up and we'll do our best to answer them as we go. It's a bit of a, a double hander, so we'll be passing backwards and forwards to, uh, to each other as we, as we go along. So, um, so that's, where we, uh, that's where we're starting. And I'm apologies, I'm going to have to ask Nina, I think, to change the slides. It's mine is, mine is frozen. I've had a technical difficulty this morning. Oh, no. so <laughs> I can be on slide duty. That's fine. I can do okay. <laughs> Do you want to slip to the next slide then? Ciao. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Matthew said, my specialism, if you like, is internal comms and workplace communication. So uh, the last six months has been quite odd uh, and it's been a bit of a challenge. But it's, there has actually been some amazing stuff going on as well. And uh, for every HR person out there that has been working their socks off, I suspect there are as many comms people that have been thrown challenges that they would never have expected to face and uh, certainly thinking back to March and early April in terms of uh, employee communications and, and companies as a whole um, that we were in, we were in quite a fortunate position because uh, teams were people were, were kind of willing to, to go with it you know there we didn't know all the answers we didn't know what was going to happen but we had we were united with this common enemy, if you like, of coronavirus. And whilst we didn't have all the solutions straight away, people were, were willing to go with what they needed to do, mainly because there was bigger things to worry about. You know, we, we knew we kind of needed to keep the wheels turning, but we didn't mind that it wasn't perfect. We, uh, we were more concerned with caring about each other and finding out how each other was doing. And if we could keep work going on in, in the background and, and keep sharing information, that was a good thing. And actually it was, Bearing in mind that in back in March, we were in a workplace culture where less than 10% of people had regular access to, to work, to, to be able to work remotely. The transition to being able to make work function properly uh, from remote locations was amazing. Frankly, every, you know, we all did an amazing job to, to be able to make it keep working. Uh, but of course, time moves on. And the problem with time moving on is that old habits start to, to creep in and new, new worries start to creep in. Uh, and there's a big difference between having an organisation that's functioning, you know, functionally everything is still happening, and thriving, and what that actually might mean in terms of the future. And all of these fears start to creep in. Redund we start to see things about redundancies. People find frustration with the changes in, in guidelines and rules. Uh, People might also be starting to very definitely find temporary working environments quite difficult. You know, I've got the luxury of, a, of an office around me, but lots of people don't, you know, if they're, if they're working on kitchen tables and, and spare rooms. And there's, of course, the mental health issue as well, which we've all been very mindful of early on. But that doesn't go away just because we become more accustomed to working in a different environment. So especially issues around overcompensating because you're on your own and you can't judge what you're doing against your, your peers. 
And naturally, if you're on your own, you start to, to fill in the blanks. And humans are terrible for this. If they're not given the information directly, they, they will assume the worst. And of course, you've also got groups of people who are really rather liking their, their newfound flexibility and they're not overly keen to go back to an office environment that they might have been in before. You know, the, um, the suspension of, uh, of the everyday is having to come to an end. We, we, we can't put off all of those everyday work practices that we might have been able to do for the last few months. So we're in this world where people are saying that actually at home they feel more productive, which is amazing. You know, there's been a huge uplift in that, but they're also saying that they that they need to have better solutions or perhaps some more permanent decisions made around how they are going to do their work. And a big part of that is about communicating. And also there's a very big difference between working from home and remote work. And that's probably an interesting topic to explore as to the positives and negatives of, of working from home where you're trying to do what you were doing in an office and true remote work, which is where you've got the tools and the technology to be able to genuinely work flexibly from anywhere. I'll mute my microphone and pass over to Matthew now. Okay, um, thanks Neil. Just to let you know, I'm not seeing the, the slides change, so I'll probably just need you to, to carry on doing that and, and, and give me the thumbs up as and when, as and when I'm speaking. Um, so I'm just gonna, I think Nina's already made the point that you know, it, it, it's, it's real dichotomy, and I think we are seeing it come through in the uh, in in the queries and 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 requests we're getting from clients um, in terms of working from home. You know, for some people, it is a, a great utopian uh, great utopian solution. They're loving it. They've got perfect op um, perfect offices, uh, fantastic equipment, and and loads of room. Um, but for others, um, it's not there sharing the table with with their kids uh um trying to get the schoolwork done um they're um they're juggling uh, everything uh, at once and i think what we are going to see with that is that it's going to start having certain effects on um or we're not going to start to see i suppose certain social economic uh, divisions coming through with it which i think plays out in equality and diversity so for example early studies are showing uh, that younger people are finding it more difficult to work from home than uh, older people purely because of living arrangements. We are finding that not only does the burden of childcare continue to fall to women, but actually that has significantly increased uh, when um, uh, when the schools are out and, and, and lockdown is uh, and lockdown is underway in terms of the the nuts and bolts caring for children and ensuring that children are are being educated. Um, we are also seeing um, uh, issues come through in terms of um, uh, in terms of um, race uh, and how different um, uh, people from different cultural backgrounds are adapting to having the imposition of Zoom calls in in houses, for example. So there's lots of issues that are starting to come through, and I think there has to be this recognition that for some, working from home is very positive; for others, it's not. Um, for others, it's very much a, um, a, a second best. Um, the other issue there, of course, is that for those who are finding it more positive, it's, it's, it's on the whole the more affluent, a bit more space, a um, bit more control over work. And I think what that means is there's more likely that we will be imposing a, uh, a, a model um, that senior managers see as a, a, a real solution to a number of problems um, on people who have different problems and, and difficulties with that. Um, so I'll pass back to you, Nina, I think, for the next slide. So it might sound obvious, but we are reaching that crossroads. So we can't, we have, we can't go back and we have to accept the present as having been perhaps a bit of an emergency solution. We just needed to keep going. But now we've got this opportunity to, to learn from the, the global shift in workplaces and communications in order to be able to make the right decisions for the future. But of course, um, none of that can really happen if we're not really looking and listening and digging into some of those problems so that we can start to address them. And uh, this is where we get to look at some of the uh, some of the more unpleasant bits, some of the legal bits that might end up in uh, in Matthew's court. Uh, but we'll do that first, and then we can look at some of the the workplace com solutions to perhaps try and try and avoid them. So I will pass back over to Matthew.
Okay, yeah, thank you. Back to Mr. Doom and Gloom. Um, and uh, um, what, what I'm just going to do in the next few slides is I think try to dig into what what perhaps the most, um, the, the problem we can perhaps do most about is, um, and uh, and there's some really good stuff for those of you who've, who who um, uh, read HBR, um, you'll know that they're re really pushing out some good stuff on this. And a lot of the stuff on there is now free, so it's worth having a, a look at it. And there's this, they've done quite a large survey on, um, uh, on attitudes to working from home around the world. And, uh, uh, and again, some good, some bad experiences. And this is, this I think is the sort of the, the root of the problem. I've got the link to the article there for those of you who want to read it. COVID-19 has thrust many leaders into remote management, which requires a different skill set than face-to-face -face management. They've been forced to make this transition quickly and for the most part without training. While some jobs have proven adaptable, many sectors are not well suited for the remote environment and many workers have home lives that prevent, present overwhelming challenges. As a result, some managers may be finding their roles more difficult than before and making their subordinates' lives more stressful as they struggle to adapt. And this won't be lost on, on um, any of you, but um, one of the most significant reasons for workplace disputes is poor or effective management. Um, one of, in my view, one of the um, uh, main reasons why you have poor or ineffective management is uh, poor and or ineffective communications. So we're back to um, we're back to the value of, um, uh, of of Nina and her skill set on this. Nina, can I ask you to go to the next slide? So this is um, uh, really a breakdown of 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 or a visual representation of the previous slide and the, the three areas as as I see it or as as HBR see it, which is there are issues um, prevent, presented by remote working around managerial confidence and competence. That then feeds through to, to trust in um, remote workers. And, and th there's an awful lot of, and we'll come on to some of this, an awful lot of a sense that remote workers are not particularly trusted. And that in turn drives certain management practices, which lead to um, many detrimental effects, but in particular, in particular stress. So just looking at the next slide, um, in terms of what um, HBR found in terms of uh, in terms of managerial uh, competence and incompetence, confidence rather. Um, the first thing they found was that actually um, many managers are lacking um, confidence in how they manage remotely. 40% of managers express low self-confidence in their ability to manage workers remotely. Um, there was also a, 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 um, a connection between those um, managers who were who were struggling and those organisations which did not seem to embrace flexible working uh, working patterns. So there was a, a much more traditional um, traditional uh, um, uh, sense of hierarchy organisation and, and within the workplace, and that seems to to, to have an effect. Um, uh, as, as well. But perhaps most significantly, when those managers have low self-confidence, they are more likely to be micromanaged. And that was a finding from both the, the managers, who in many cases recognised that they were having to keep on top of um, their subordinates, and also the experience of the, uh, of the subordinates. So if we can just go to the next slide, Nina. Um, so what, what does it mean in terms of trust? Well, um, Managers who are not confident also have low confidence in their team's abilities to perform um, better remotely. 60% of managers expressed um, concerns uh, 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 about that. Um, and that fed through to um, uh, th their views about um, motivation in the, work in the workplace. And they expressed uh, a view, a majority expressed a view um, that they they were they were they were not confident that workers would stay motivated in the long term if they weren't there to be uh, to be to, to to be watched then there was going to be that lack of uh, that lack of confidence um and you'll see um the the last one and this you know this 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 idea that you know we are we are managed and we manage um but those managers who reported that they were mistrusted by their managers also reported lower levels of trust in their team. So you can see some of the themes coming through, which is lack of confidence, uh, lack of trust is bred by lack of confidence. Um, 
and lack of an organization prepared to embrace flexibility uh, causes um, causes that lower confidence to get worse. And the consequences of all, all of this on the next slide is, is of course, stress. Um, we know that stress levels are understandably extremely high at the moment uh, as a result of COVID uncertainty, etc. cetera. Um, and certainly remote, remote working when it's not done properly is, 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 adding, uh, is adding to that. Monitoring and supervision, close working and monitoring and supervision clearly gives uh, an increased level of, um, uh, creates an increased level of stress. Um, but we also find, you know, back to the cluttered kitchen table with three kids uh, and uh, uh, a mother trying to, to, to do a Zoom call at the same time. We also find that stress is caused by that conflict um, between homeworking and um, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to look after everything else that's going on in the home. And what we find, or what HBR found, is that there are there is a, a, a greater conflict for those workers who are um, subjected to higher levels of close monitoring. So monitoring leads to stress, and that's something I think we have to factor in when we're looking at how we manage how we communicate with with work um, uh, with remote workers. Um, that in turn leads to um, workers being more reluctant to switch off which leads to um, a sense of there being an always-on culture. And, of course, no surprise there, the always-on culture um, means, um, uh, means that there is a greater sense of, of interference between the, uh, the work-life balance. So looking at all of this, having, having the wrong managerial, uh, managerial approach, uh, having managers who are not confident, leads to... Um, problems in the workforce um that may seem that may seem that may seem obvious but it's useful i think just to see that other side of remote working um and uh and and, and look at the hbr uh, look at the hbr evidence on that because they they have done quite a quite an extensive study so it is worth worth just focusing on that nina back to you i think for the next um for the next slide yes so thinking about those three areas, the trust and stress and managerial competence, what I wanted to look at was perhaps some of the key communication touch points that you'd have in an organisation where those three things are really important. And you could pick a lot of topics, you know, you could be doing stuff around leadership comms, specific line management communications. But in terms of those big areas, these five where you've got new employees coming into an organisation, also potentially redundancies within an organisation, grievances, health and safety in all its forms, physical and mental, and then also inclusion as well. They're probably five key pillars where if you don't address those, those three topics around competence, trust and stress, you could have some real problems. So legally, we're just going to look at some of the legal issues and then we will go into some of the ways that you can be tackling those five areas positively. So I'll pass back over to Matthew to do that. Okay, thanks. Just leave it on that slide for a moment, Nina, um, because I think um, we, we both put, put our slides together independently, but I found this one extremely useful. Uh, and I think looking at that in, or looking at how you communicate and how communication has been affected in each of those areas really does really does get you a, um, does, does get you a long way. And when I look at the, the types of things we've been advising on over the past, uh, over the past few months, uh, you know, they, they really are the, the, the key ones, certainly the, the middle three of those. So redundancies, yes, obviously uh, um, a, a very significant number of redundancies uh, coming through and clearly issues about how you communicate um, those, um, uh, you know, w w what is very difficult news to, 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 to individuals remotely. Um, just proving very difficult for organisations. One of the things we have noticed is that actually many employees have not been that willing to engage in consultation uh, remotely. It can be difficult to get people onto calls in the first place. Grievances and complaints, um, again, very, very significant. Um, there's a lot of stress out there, as we've seen, and that tends to, for, that to come through in, um, in this area. And again, I think it's caused by the fact that people aren't there to nip problems in the bud. Um, you know, I, I think that's a real issue. And health and safety, a whole new world of health and safety is opening up in terms of um, COVID preparedness, uh, remote working, etc. So, so I think they're, re they're, they're, they're really good 
good things to focus on. But if I can ask you to go to the next slide and the, the legal issues I looked at. So what I thought I'd do is just, and this might help you when you know, reporting through to the board, etc. just looking at where the, where the real risk issues are that we're seeing and what, um, what steps you can do uh, about them, where you should be putting your, 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 your focus. Back to the health and safety point, um, both stress at work claims and actually other forms of personal injury claims. If you're working at your kitchen table or if you're working on the corner of, um, uh, on the corner of your bedside table um, on a tiny laptop and you're doing that for eight, nine, ten hours a day, then that is going to have an effect upon, uh, uh, upon your posture, um, upon your health and safety. So whether we're looking at this from a, a mental health perspective or we're looking at it from a, a physical health perspective, um, we need to see that as now being a, uh, a, a, a significant risk in ways in which I don't think we'd seen before. And there are some just some examples there of, of, of things I think you should be looking at. So risk assessments is the obvious one. And don't neglect risk assessments for those working um, working from home. Um, Secondly, I think it's 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 looking at, at communication because communication in the right way helps with well-being, um, and well-being is a important factor in mitigating the risks of um, of, of mental health um, uh, mental health issues. I would revisit your employee assistance programs um, and ensure that they are they are fit for purpose. And I think the more you push those, um, the better. I think as employees become more used to communicating remotely, uh, they will be much quicker at picking up on some of the uh, the, the, um, uh, the remote uh, aspects of, of many of the EAP systems which are now in place and, uh, uh, and which seem to be working well. And I go back, this is a point we always make when we're looking at stress at work claims. One of the things a court will ask, one of the things a court is always keen to see is that there has been an employee assistance program put in place and that employees have been signposted towards it and encouraged to use it. So employee assistance programs, really, really important um, uh, in terms of mitigating your, your risk as an employer. Um, and finally, just pick up on this idea that monitoring is stressful. Um, for those being uh, being monitored, we hear all sorts of wizard ideas about how you can monitor keystrokes, how you can uh, how you can look at whether or not people are paying attention on Zoom calls, etc. Um, there are a number of artificial intelligence uh, applications coming out looking at how employees are using certain words and the effect of those words, etc. And yeah, great if you need them, um, use them, but use them warily because what we are seeing is that monitoring leads to stress. We also need to be aware, aware there of, of, of the data protection implications. And the message from the Information Commissioner is clear, which is that monitoring surveillance is by its very nature harmful and therefore needs to be justified. So just watch that one. Um, Mr. Doom and Gloom again, um, other risks we're seeing. I think there is an increasing risk of discrimination uh, claims and actually, I think after two calls I've already had this morning, I would add whistleblowing claims to that as, as well. Um, we're seeing um, uh, discrimination claims, are, I think, potentially more likely because of the, the way in which the lockdown coronavirus in general is, um, is, is, is starting to show where there are divisions in, uh, in the workplace. I mentioned earlier about the, the burden of childcare still falling on, on women. Um, and I think that's something which which we have to take into account when we're looking at indirect sex discrimination, uh, for example, and how that's that's going to work in the future. So way way to mitigate that risk, I think, is by looking at your flexible working policies uh, and making sure that there is a general understanding, particularly amongst senior managers, of the increased burden. And the fact that that burden often has to be picked up at short notices as, as uh as children come home from school because the school's had a COVID outbreak or because somebody in the class has um, caused for the need to isolate or because there's just not enough teachers, etc. So watch that one. Um, we are also seeing evidence of discrimination and harassment online um, increasing. Um, uh, don't know if any of you use Slack, but Slack seems to be a particularly, um, uh, a particularly pre prevalent uh, network for um, for that to happen. Um, it seems as if employees 
are forgetting the boundaries between social, um, personal social media and business social media. So I think revisit your social media policies, revisit your bullying and harassment policies and make sure that you are um, uh, taking into account good use of social media in those in those policies. Uh, really important stuff. So if I can ask you to go to the next slide, um, Nina, uh, this is largely back to to what we were saying at the beginning. One of the, you know, the, the, the real things underlying this is 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 ineffective management. I think it's always been a case that we see far more disputes coming out of uh, managers not quite doing what they should do uh, than out of, of of anything else. You know, the, the the good managers communicate well. They nip problems in the bud. Uh, they engender trust in their uh, in their employees. When that is when that is not there, when there are it's poor communication, when managers are letting things slide, that's when problems tend to. Uh, tend to arise so i think again what do we do mitigate to mitigate that um i think we have to to to, to recognize that managers um competences are being challenged by um remote working uh and we need to um uh, ensure that's addressed and clearly this is this presentation is um is is part of that is part of that process um, I think we need to review internal dispute resolution measures, particularly informal ones. The ability to be able to nip problems in the bud because they're observed early or because you can have very informal conversations which just diffuse a situation can't take place anymore. So I think we need to look at how we might uh, how we might do that if it's in case of a case of checking in with the team more frequently and just making sure you understand where their particular bugbears um, may be. Uh, whether it's um, looking at other forms of, of um, dispute resolution, such as online mediation, etc., and being able to do those very quickly and easily uh, before problems arise. But certainly acknowledging the fact that, um, you know, much dispute resolution has actually happened without anyone noticing that that's what's happening. Um, uh, and that, that's more difficult, really, I think, needs to be needs to be done. And again, just revisit your policies, performance reviews, um, your appraisals, your um, your performance in, improvement plans, etc., to make sure that they are fit for purpose. If you are primarily managing people uh, people remotely, um, so I would put that together as a as a as shopping list. I'm sure you've all got far much, too much to do anyway over the next few months. But in terms of of dealing with some of the the longer term issues of remote working in terms of actually getting to a position where you are understanding what what needs to be done as we move towards the fact that we could be working like this for um or, or at least indefinitely i think getting some getting some of the fundamentals prepared is is, is really important so at that point i'm going to hand over to nina again and you'll be pleased to know that's the last you've um you've heard of mr doom and gloom <laughs> nina over to you Look at some of the other bits. Well, just there's there's obviously lots of other things that can be added to the added to the to do list as well. Uh, but we're going to look at ways um, that you can improve and support your communication um, processes across those those five sections. So the first one that we were going to look at was around working with new employees. Now, it's 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 a tough old gig being a new employee and going into a company at best of times. Um, but it's even harder if you're having to start out remotely and you're not able to necessarily meet people in the flesh. Now, it might sound really obvious, but making sure that people have access to technology ahead of time is a big thing. And that's not just the hardware, that's access to all of the, the logins they might need, to the software they might need. It's also, I mentioned about that crossroads earlier on, it's also now perhaps getting to a point where you do need to think about investing some time and skill in things like filming site tours. If you've got a, a, a mixed environment where you might have retail sites or manufacturing sites, but you've got also people working remotely who might not be able to go and do those site visits that they would have done as part of an onboarding process. You need to start thinking about how you build that in as part of an ongoing long term remote working strategy. Also about how the team introduced themselves as well, more than just a, a quick hello on that first team's call and then straight into work. You know, there needs to be the opportunities to create some connections that would have happened organically anyway in an in a office environment. And you're now having to. To, to create those or artificially. There's also uh, a big issue around, it might sound a bit dramatic to say psychological safety, but the thing is, of course, is that if you're a new employee, you want to impress people. And 
you could end up hugely overcompensating because of that working too hard just to be visible as well. So when you're talking to new employees, whether uh, as part of an HR team or as a line manager, being really clear about the expectations. And uh, I mentioned at the bottom about it's you're about checking in with people. Now, we don't want that micromanagement that we talked about earlier, but it's really important to have new employees know that they can be talking to you as often as they need to without feeling like they're bothering you. I was talking to a friend of mine, actually, who's uh, she started her new role a week before lockdown. And she said that she hated the fact that she was constantly having to email or telephone or text because it, it felt too formal rather than just being able to poke your head around the door and say, can I just check this or just check in with someone else? And you always feel like you're perhaps having to go to the same person. So also one of the big things that you could do with new employees is, is really bring that buddy system to the fore. Now, I know lots of companies perhaps have buddy systems beforehand within an office environment, but it's quite useful to have a peer as a buddy. So you perhaps don't feel like you're having to constantly go to a manager that you can just talk to someone else about all those weird nitty gritty things that you need to learn when you start at a new company. So setting expectations with people to start with about the fact that, you know, we're, we're all finding our way through this and there isn't this need to be doing crazy hours and just to feel the need to be fitting in because that isn't the way that you want to be uh, to starting people out with their, with their new career because that is only going to lead to problems. The flip side of that, of course, is thinking about redundancies and redundancies are never pleasant and even less so in this uh, particular set of circumstances because a lot of the redundancies that we're seeing now it's not because we would want to be losing those people under any other circumstances. You know, there are companies that are having to lose people that they would love to keep. And it's simply through this set of circumstances that they are having to go. And that that there's there's huge emotional layers in that. So a, a huge part of if you're a larger company and you're dealing with um uh, employee reps, communications training for those reps is really important, not just because they do need to be talking to their, their, their groups of employees in, in a certain way. Neutral questioning, active listening, being able to relay that information back, uh, perhaps in a written format where they might have been able to have face-to-face -face meetings beforehand, but also because they might not be able to physically get to the people that they would have seen in, a, in, a, in an office or uh, factory environment, wherever it might have been. So they're having to use different communication channels to get hold of their people. And they may not naturally feel confident or comfortable with doing that. Uh, so it's really important to, to have uh, those open lines of, of communication and, and have people well trained to be able to get hold of everybody in, in, in a workforce. It isn't as simple as just gathering everyone together in a staff room and having a conversation with them. The use of live video, and I'll talk about channels a little bit later on, but but live video when you are communicating those big message is messages is is has always was important, but has become even more important now. That that face-to-face -face live messaging from the right people in the organization. Funnily enough, Facebook have just uh, released some information around some of the uh, some of the studies that and findings that they found, and even in a in a big tech giant like them. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg's regular regular Q and A only used to be tuned into by about seven percent of the organisation, which is pretty low. Um, since um, coronavirus, it's now up to seventy percent tuning into his regular broadcasts. So the the need to consume live content and live video has increased massively. Uh, and again, we're at that crossroads point where if you need to start thinking about having the right technology to be able to do that as a broadcast piece, now is the time to start thinking about how you put that into place. There's also that need for support post announcement of redundancies, because what would have happened before? The, the announcement would have been made and instantly people would have gone off to have their conversations and their chats and find what's going on and what that means for me and what does that happen. And of course, if you just turn off a video or put down a phone, you're back in your isolation again. And the need to overcome that with planned one-to-ones, team calls, and have them structured and built in, have the line managers there ready to go to pick up the phone and have those conversations is even more important because there's nothing more devastating than having that announcement made and then you are back on your own and you, you haven't got anyone to, to necessarily talk to about it. And there's also a big thing, like I mentioned at the start, about the fact that a lot of these redundancies are happening because it's been forced and it's not necessarily because it's something that anyone would want to be doing. But it's about using schemes like outplacement, 
where you are able to communicate and protect your your brand and your organization's values because you are supporting people as best as you possibly can at a time when they're exiting your business. There might come a time in, in a year or 18 months where you might want to be hiring some of those same people again. And helping people to exit well in a way that they can see a positive future is not just about doing the right thing for them, but it's also about doing the right thing for your brand as well. When we were talking about how much we care and we want to know how you're all feeling back in March, well, at a, a point where people might be leaving a business as well, that still needs to, to feel the same as well. It needs to be people leaving the business in the right way. Grievances and complaints. Now, from a communications perspective, a lot of this, again, is about that isolation piece, be, people being left to stew on their own if they've got an issue with someone. They're not able to let off steam in the same way that they might be able to. They, they're not able to have those nip it in the bud conversations, exactly as Matthew was saying. So proactive communications, the minute that something is spotted as potentially being an issue, even if it's body language on a, on a, on a Teams call, those sort of things can just be picked up and, and those conversations can be had potentially before it becomes more of an issue. But of course, one of the big things is um, people feeling comfortable and confident about how they do raise an issue. Because again, those lines of communication, those traditional lines of communication, are now not as easy to, to, to use. And actually line managers more than ever have become gatekeepers to being able to raise those issues. And if your problem is with your line manager, well, where do you go and how do you have those conversations? So clear signposting within an organization about how employees do raise issues is really important. Just expecting line managers to be able to pick up and deal with all those issues, as Matthew said, very often line managers are, are a big part of the problem. So being able to speak to teams separately or being able to make sure that employees have got com uh, confident lines of communication to be able to talk to you or whoever it might be about a problem, that's great. Um, and I, I put this bit in about mediation. I did say to Matthew, actually, you might not want me to talk about mediation because it might be better if people are going straight to the lawyers. But I've always been surprised that mediation isn't used more frequently and used early as well, because I see mediation as being a preventative measure and, it, and not that last cause of last cause of action. You know, it's again, it's about underpinning that brand integrity. You know, it's about we want to resolve this problem and we are prepared to bring in an independent person to help you do that rather than a problem being allowed to get so far down the line that it's a, a point of last recourse. So, again, mediation, I think, is, is not just a, an emergency tool. I think it's part and parcel of our new way of working, that if we can't nip things in the bud early, that we have these tools that we use uh, where we can do it online or we can you know, bring people together in, uh, in a safe environment to be able to, to iron those problems out. Just on that point, Nina, I think actually mediation has become even easier now um, as people are prepared to do it online. Um, they can be quicker. There's not as much travelling involved. There's not shuttling between rooms, etc., um, so, yeah, absolutely looking at how you use it earlier on um, is, is key. Mm. You know, the um, health and safety and health and safety can be looked at from, uh, you know, you can be looking at everything from electrical overload in a in a brand new home office through to, to mental health. So right now it's really important to be talking about the fact that you don't know everything. And if you're thinking about creating a safe long-term working environment away from the office, then it's really important to be talking to your employees about the fact that you don't know everything. You don't know everything about what equipment you might be able to provide or the environment you need people to be working in. But again, where we talked about early on, if you, if you aren't communicating, if you aren't talking, people will just make assumptions about what is or isn't going to happen. So sharing the fact that you don't know everything. That's what we were doing back in March. We didn't know everything about coronavirus we still don't but we didn't know everything about what was going to happen with coronavirus and and it's important to use those lessons and apply them all the time if you don't know tell people you don't know but that helps buy you time whilst you are working out what you're doing there's also this issue around the fact that people might be really happy at home um, 
and they might not want to be going back into the office. So they might not be entirely honest or open about their working environments because they would still rather stay at home because it's more convenient for family life, but they are in an environment that isn't health, safe or healthy because, you know, like Matthew was saying, they're, you know, they're perched on a coffee table or the edge of the bed or, you know, and people are prepared to put up and compromise with that to their own detriment long term in order to perhaps keep that perceived flexibility. So sending out a, a one shot survey where you ask people, are you all OK with your working environment? You need to be digging a little bit deeper into if you want to create that long term solution for people at home, people have got to um, be, you know, sort of be probed a bit more about the environment they're in and, and is that going to work for them? Uh, but of course, you can only start having those conversations when you know where you want to go as an organisation. One of the questions that I can see that's come in is about the fact that um, an, an employer is wanting to get everyone back into the office, but they're really enjoying being at home. So, you know, what are what are the, the communications or legal advice about how they do that in the best way? Well, ultimately, you as an employer have got to make a decision about what's best for your uh, for your organisation. And that might be that everyone is back, but it's about giving a, a good reason as to why that's back. You know, it, if it's about the fact the job simply can't be done from home, you know, you've had to kind of do it as a bit of an emergency solution. But ultimately, you can't fulfill the needs for your customers. Well, there needs to be a, a you know, sort of the, the the business case put forward. I think, you know, I think I've I've heard of you know legal queries where people are simply refusing to turn to work, return to work, and I think that becomes much more of a legal issue. It, yeah, it does. Just to, to chip in there, and, and thanks for the question, Lorraine. I think, um, I think, it, it, you know, the, the principle has to be that there's there's very little um, protection from in, for employees if the employer says, "No, we want you back. Um, you're contracted to work for us at the office, and we want you in." And as long as the employer is um, is, is is taking into account proper health and safety measures. Um, doing their COVID risk assessments, ensuring that that risk assessment is published if they have the appropriate number of employees, etc., then then that should be enough. Um, where we end up with issues is 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 primarily, I think, on an individual basis. Um, you have employees who genuinely are concerned about their health and safety should they return to the office, but actually, when push comes to shove, they do not have that much protection. Um, you then have employees who. Um, are perhaps enjoying working from home and so are coming up with reasons why they can't go back into the office. And again, uh, they don't have uh, much protection, really. The, the category of employees, I think, where there is a degree of more protection are those who genuinely have health conditions, um, which uh, put them in, um, in, in high-risk groups. Um, and, and actually the jury is out on them as to as to precisely what level of protection that they uh, that they do have I think the but I think it's it's looking at each employee on an individual an individual um, case by case basis if they are objecting to that but what that says suggests to me and Liam tell me if this is wrong is that actually given the given the fact that the legal issues are relatively unfavorable to employees in that situation it becomes much more important to to not ride roughshod over those employees feelings for for non-legal reasons because otherwise you just have a load of grumpy people back in the world that aren't performing particularly well so actually the 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 need to persuade and the need to to be trying to take those employees um uh, uh feelings into account becomes all more important it can become if you are wanting to bring people back into the office, then you need to be looking at what you're not taking away from them, but it's about what you're adding to them. So it is about people being able to have those conversations. It's about innovation. It's about easier collaboration. We've done an amazing job of doing this remotely, but there is something to be said about having having those those small sparks of uh, of inspiration when you are just having those conversations, those those um uh, uh, informal conversations that there, there does need to feel like a bit of a celebration of coming back it does need to be if that's what you want to do as an employer uh, so it isn't about pulling people back from something that they've uh, that, they're, that they're going to be losing out on it's about creating a new better more positive environment in the, in the working environment that they're in that you've had the opportunity to learn from things that have perhaps 
have gone really well in the in the last few months and still want to use those still use the opportunities what's the point of doing all of this if we just you know pack it in a box and never use it again but actually if you are wanting to bring people back into into the office then it is about thinking about the things that they might not have been able to do over the last few months and 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 really use those as a as a positive and a, an advantage so I would I would say that's the go come at it from the from the positive and not what you're taking away. Ultimately, there might be people who just love that new flexibility so much that that just isn't what they want to do. And do you know what? That has to be their choice as an individual. But you can only do what you can do that's right for your business. You look back at your purpose and your values as an organization. What are you doing for your, your customers, your customer base, whatever it, you might be doing? And how are you going to help your people? fulfill that as an organization in, in an environment that's uh, that's working well. There's also a big thing in terms of health and safety around mental health. We've talked a huge amount about mental health over the last few months. Uh, you've got issues around burnout, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a huge thing. You know, if you're on your own, you think everyone's doing better than you, everyone's working harder than you. Your people aren't necessarily seeing the things that you're producing. You're not as visible in the workforce. Imposter syndrome is a huge, uh, a huge issue. Um, and before lockdown, we were doing a huge amount of work with mental health first aiders uh, around training and actually being able to create visible connections with the mental health first aiders that you might have in your workplace already so that um, your employees can access them easily. Uh, if you don't have them already, the training can now be done online, which is so it's much easier to make sure that you've got people that are accredited. Because, you know, you, you're not having that, you know, you walk into a kitchen and you can see someone having a breakdown by the kettle, you know, that that thing isn't happening anymore. So asking the question and making sure you've got mental health first aiders that are dipping in and being visible is really, really important because the last thing you want is that people is for people to be suffering long term in their uh, in their remote environments. And um, the, the, the last of the five that I was talking about is around creating that inclusive environment and we you know we talk about in inclusion encompasses so many things uh, inclusion is a is a really significant driver of employee engagement because it plays to that feeling of being valued of being heard and of being respected you know whatever it is that you are bringing to your organization the fact that you can you you feel a, a valued part of it is hugely important but of course that's harder now because you aren't being seen as often and you don't have those micro interactions around a, an organization. So it's about being able to adapt your communications to reflect the needs of your audience. Now, that might be if you think about the fact that a remote working environment might be more favorable for people who couldn't do a daily commute and a long day in an office. Uh, and uh, spending all those hours, there there are greater employment opportunities for for broader sections of people, and I'm sure that you're probably thinking about how you can add that into your talent strategies uh, to be able to use remote working to be able to expand your talent pool. But then you need to to think about how you um, reflect this in your communications. Again, thinking about those crossroads and and that investment. So it could be some really simple things like making sure that you are adding closed captioning onto your videos because I don't know about you sometimes even you know the calls that I'm on sound quality isn't great uh, it can it, you know there, there's people talking over each other video quality isn't always great so things like closed captioning is really important even adding audio descriptions onto your videos as well now there are free tools out there I use uh, I use a platform called Capwing which is really really good it's free there's loads of it's a brilliant website you can build amazing stuff in there uh, with very little skill uh, and for no money, which uh, which is always good. Um, so I would encourage you to go and uh, use the Capwing tool to be able to have a play around and, and start adding uh, captioning and, and things like that on. Really, really important to make sure that communications aren't just about assuming that your audience is able to do what it always was in, in the workplace or even what they've been putting up with for the last few months. But also it's about uh, giving representation groups uh, an opportunity to come back together where we have we've always talked about trying to break down silos across an organization and yet by the very nature of having to work remotely we are perhaps feeling more siloed than ever before we're in our teams groups and you know on our zoom calls and we aren't crossing people in the corridors and we're not seeing people in canteens we're not working we're not walking through factory environments we're not in car parks we're not seeing people from different parts of the business so 
representation groups um, and having the opportunity to bring those together, whether that's around diversity inclusion, whether that's around mental health, whether that's around charity and fundraising, uh, need that opportunity to come together in order to be able to thrive. And actually, do you need new ones? Do you need, need to create some new groups where you can start to bring in um, some of the, you know, have you got lone worker groups? Have you got working parent groups? Have you got, you know, sort of uh, interest groups for people to be able to come together to perhaps replicate some of that social interaction that they would have had? You know, um, environments that I've been in before, companies that I've been in before, have had, you know, really proactive charity environments or uh, running groups and that kind of thing. And of course, those things aren't happening spontaneously. So, what can you do to to replicate some of that social interaction within your organisation? And of course, how you do it is all about the channels that you choose. So there's been some really, really interesting uh, information that's come out about our, our habits, uh, our media consumption habits while we were on lockdown. So um, one of the things that I would always talk about as an employee, as an internal comms uh, expert is look at what your employees consume externally, because that's where they're going for their information and their uh, entertainment. And that's where they already are. That's what they already like. So that's really what you need to be replicating internally as much as you can, because that's where your audience already wants to be. These are this is um, this diagram is, is latest releases from Ofcom looking at what people were consuming. Huge increase in consumption. You'll be unsurprised to learn during uh, lockdown. But the. Uh, the biggest areas, live TV, so we were talking about that live broadcast, and actually a big uplift in, in what would be considered those traditional, uh, the broadcasters, so the, the BBC saw an uplift, Sky saw an uplift as well in terms of where people were going to get their information. The biggest uh, channel percentage increase, though, was about video on demand, so that is... Um, uh, Netflix, Disney Plus, it's this, it's the streaming services where people can go to get what they want when they want it. And I think this is going to be a huge shift in terms of the channels that uh, um, organisations start to use with their employees. It's about creating content that their employees found, find valuable that they can go and get when they want it. So it is about recording content like this and being able to play it back. It's about um, having really clear um, conversations. So there's a big shift from, from content being scripted to being it more conversational and more about answering questions from people. So it is about perhaps recording loads of Q&As that have come in and people being able to access them when they want to. And this is an amazing opportunity to actually shift the, your mixture of, of communication channels to really replicate what your audience is wanting. One of the interesting things is that radio, which has always, you know, it's a, it's a huge, obviously long-standing channel, saw a big dip because people weren't commuting beginning and end of the day, but it was holding true in the middle of the day, which largely plays to people that are driving or are out in their cars during the day. And obviously you've got healthcare workers, engineers, delivery drivers, huge parts of, uh, of industry across the country. And I wonder how many organisations are really using things like podcasts or radio broadcasts to communicate with those huge sectors of, uh, of, of industry. And it's really easy. It's, it's re there's very little barrier to entry to be able to create podcasts. There's, there's free tech out there to be able to have a go. So why not? Why not try something different? And, and speaking, if you've got large lots of people working remotely it doesn't have to be people in their cars anymore it could be someone sat in their their office at home that's able to access a, a podcast and have it playing whilst they're doing their work why not it's something completely different i would say the big shift now is about um the comms teams working really closely with it because you've it have had to work on the fly to be able to give people, they've had to, you know, get over security protocols, structural protocols, uh, to be able to make things happen. So the comms and IT teams are absolutely ripe for being able to collaborate together to, to get some of these new comms channels up and running and working uh, together. So even more, I mean, I would always say that comms and HR are, you know, best friends, but actually comms and IT probably need to be best friends at the moment to make sure that uh, the, the, the new channels that you want to try are actually going to work across your organisation. Um, and then also the big thing, if you are working remotely, is it 
is about avoiding ambiguity in your communications. No ifs or buts, nuance gets lost really easily when you are working remotely uh, and you're not seeing people in their natural environment. So I would be saying that if you're thinking about line manager communication, and there's a whole other webinar to be done on that, but the clear lines of communication to line managers is what do they need to know? What do they need to share? What do they need to do? And what do they need to feed back to you? And if you think about your communications and using those four things, then you're gonna avoid the stuff they don't need to know, the extraneous stuff, and you're gonna give them some really clear information to be able to share with their teams. So, what's next? And we'll have, a, there's some other questions coming, we'll have a look at those in a sec. But some of the, the things you need to talk to yourself about and think about in your uh, organization is, do you really know what your employees want and need from company communications? If you're going to be investing potentially in new platforms or new technology, you've got to be really sure about what people are actually consuming. Don't ask them if they want a new intranet or a new this because they don't know. Ask them what they already consume externally. Where do they go to get their information? So is your internal comms fit for purpose? Have you actually got a way of talking to your employees over and over again, being able to ask questions and get that feedback back from them? And also need to think about how people's work selves have changed. The dynamics of a team have changed. People have changed in terms of, you know, the way they want to work, their values, what's that done? So there are some really good tools out there to be able to do those team dynamics. I'm sure, you know, sort of people will have done some work around that. But there are some some amazing tools that we use that where you look at the drivers of what people value and how they work together as a team. We obviously, you know, we we put together employee surveys, which really, you know, sort of are exactly geared around bringing people back to work and, and what they will value. And also, you know, internal comms channels is my world. So, you know, that's the in terms of getting it right for the right mix of uh, your organization, thinking about your internal comms channels. They're probably the, th the three key questions that you would be asking yourselves right now before you put anything else into place. So. That's the main things for me. Should we have a look at some of the questions? Yeah, thanks, Nina. That was really useful. Um, so there's a, a few questions here. Um, which so the first one um, from from Lisa. Any tips on developing guidelines for output based performance management without over monitoring employees? Um, I suppose the um, if, if I look at that from a from the, what I see in terms of performance management, I think it's the first thing is to understand. What, what your output actually is. Um, you know, what, what is it that you want the employee to, to produce um, and, and ensure you're measuring that? I think there is a, you know, well, it's trite, isn't it? Um, you, 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 you manage what can be measured. And I think at the moment, and I alluded to this earlier, there's a number of project products out there, particularly using the AI label in terms of looking at how you monitor remote performance um, uh, and, and, and or manage performance remotely and I think that tends to then um, dictate what you are what you are managing rather than actually how you do it so I think the the, the the message I would see is and this goes back to you know sort of experience of looking at disputes in this area you've got to be clear you've just got to be absolutely clear in what you are uh, wanting to um, uh, wanting an employee to produce, and then to a certain extent, perhaps giving them the tools to do it and letting them letting them get on with it. Uh, so, so from my perspective, I think that. But that's back to that message of clarity, Nina. So I don't know if you've got anything to add to add on that. I think um, an important thing is to is to not try and necessarily retrofit what you might have done before. So it's it, it is an opportunity to to look at what is valuable to you as an organisation now um, and also think about um, where do your employees want to go so what skills do they need to be developing what do they need to be exhibiting and again I'd be going back to the purpose and values of an organization you know if they hold true for you know that where you were before pre-covid well purpose and values don't don't change you know is that employee still uh, delivering against against those things it might be in a different set of circumstances and it might be more flexible um, but if you don't trust people that over monitoring and and you know sort of not trusting people well 
what does that say about your your organization and and how you want people to thrive so i hate using the you know sort of the the idea of of you know letting people almost get themselves into trouble that's that's the wrong way of perhaps phrasing it but you've got to have an an organization that is where you trust people to get it right and you deal with them if they don't get it right you know but i'd rather be allowing people to have the opportunity rather than imposing on them straight away i think that's probably that feels better from a from a communications perspective definitely to trust people trust is everything um here's a question for you from nicola um how do you balance not telling people information and example is the need to do a a COVID-19 test and test and trace etc versus more engaging methods of comms changing it up as want to still keep up a level of comms not turn them off so I suppose the thing is there are some positive messages there are some negative messages there are some um, uh, some some more confidential messages um, etc how do we how do we balance all of those I think the um my, my view in terms of direction and instruction, there will always be things that people have to do, um, but the, it always has to be phrased in terms of, well, why would you want to do it? What's the, what's the purpose of why you would want to do it? And that comes back to pretty much everything in terms of, of health and safety messaging, you know, or, um, or where, where you have got to direct and instruct people. If you just tell people that they must do something, you are naturally going to have a percentage of your employees who will actively push back on that. So a lot of it has got to be framed around the, 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 the positive benefits of it. Now, that might seem obvious. It has also got to, um, I would also really encourage the use of, um, of peer-to-peer communication. And also um, you start talking about it in terms of, uh, groups that have already done or succeeded in that area or that you know they've undertaken that work or they've done what they needed to do and they're being seen to be praised and it's and it's successful for them and there is that weird thing where people don't like to be left behind line managers don't like they don't like to be left out so there will come a a, a point where people will want to get involved there's also this really important thing where um uh, within an organization the, the those peer led conversation if you're if you're having the right you're sharing the information with with perhaps with influential employees who will share that positive need to do something. They can be hugely influential. You you might only need to have five percent of an organisation talking positively about something to be able to get the greater majority of an organisation to go with you on something. If it, if the information is coming from from the wrong person at the top that can turn people off. Sometimes it, it absolutely has to come from the top. But more often than not, peer-led conversations are more are more valuable. So I would be seeing who your influencers are to be able to have those conversations as well as it coming from you. Okay, good stuff. Thank you. And one final question. I know we're pushing the time a bit, but mm-hmm. I think this is a good question. I think it's worth us dealing with. So Rebecca asks, we've had feedback that those on site are feeling that more focus is on those working remotely and who have access to the internet, etc. Our manufacturing teams are not able to access PCs as easily. How can we continue to include and engage them in, in comms? And it was ever thus. I think if you've got if you've got uh, non-connected uh, or non-digitized uh, employee teams, that's always been the case. So you've got you know COVID or non-COVID, that has has always been a, an, an issue within internal comms that the people that are on the shop floor feel that they miss out. Uh, or the people that are out in their cars feel that they miss out. So where you've got a situation now, if you are looking at investment in technology, talking about that crossroads point again, uh, about what might be accessible, not necessarily on a PC, what is accessible on people's phones? I've done loads of research with manufacturing companies where I ask the question about would they feel comfortable about having uh, communications from their organisation on their mobile phone? Everyone's got a smartphone. About, and and more often than not the answer is yes because if it's information that they need to do their job better then then they will accept that so perhaps now is that opportunity to look at that crossroads point where you think about the technology that you're investing in where are they going to get their information because I bet you anything you like it's their smartphones it's a it's a peer group conversation Uh, so I would be looking at how you can um, start to think about bringing that technology in as well but also when you have got offline um, and um, non-connected 
uh, employees, their line manager is absolutely key. So I would be focusing a huge amount of, uh, of communication support among their team leaders and their line managers. I would be bringing them together as a separate group in terms of uh, briefing them, giving them communications uh, training, uh, in terms of talking to them about how you would like them to be sharing that information. Again, getting away from that script to bringing in conversations and asking for feedback. Getting feedback back from your disconnected, your offline teams is really important because they want, they really want their voice to be heard. This has always been there. That challenge has always been there. But I do think that this um, massive experiment in comms has kind of proved that the, the technology to be able to bring people together is there. And this is why I'm saying, you know, get your get your comms and your IT people together and, uh, and find a way to get those disconnected employees up and running. Good stuff. Yeah. Thank you. And I suppose also looking at things like making sure if you're expecting use of uh, smartphones, etc. And then there's some Wi-Fi and uh, some Wi-Fi hubs around so people can actually log on and do that kind of thing. So for, back, back to your point about IT. <laughs> well, um, I think we should we should halt there because um, uh, because of the time. But but Nina, that's been um, that's been excellent. I've picked up um, so, so many um, so many tips. Um, and I think the, the key one is one. There's not a one size fits all approach to this, and there's also a need to fit to, to really think laterally about what works. Um, so um, so thank you very much um, for that. Thank you everybody for, uh, for 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 logging in and listening today. I know um, Nina's address is um, email address is on the screen. Although I think LinkedIn is also a good way to get in touch with you. Yes, email. please, absolutely. Fortunately, there's not many Nina Metzens around. So, you know, <laughs> you'll find me on LinkedIn. It's dead easy. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone, for 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 for, for, for your attention today. Um, there will be a recording, um, and uh, uh, and the slides will be circulated as well. Um, I think we're probably having a feedback form at the end. We're always interested in your feedback, and if you've got any other uh, topics you'd like us to address, then um, uh, then then give us a shout. As we're always happy to pick up uh, pick up suggestions. But thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye bye.